that time 30 corps would be in the area. All being well, the Polish brigade would occupy the positions to the east of Arnhem. The 1st Air Landing Brigade would be in position to the west. The 4th Para Brigade to the north, while the 1st Para Brigade would be withdrawn into reserve, holding the bridge itself and areas to the south. That was the plan. It was assumed that German defences in the area were virtually non-existent, and so the plan's great flaw, the distance from the dropping zone to the bridge, would not present a problem. But the Germans were far from beaten. But Second Army intelligence officers chose to ignore warnings from the Dutch resistance that no less than two SS Panzer divisions had moved into the area to refit and recuperate after the poundings they'd received in Normandy. They would have their revenge. But thoughts of defeat were far from the airborne soldiers' minds as the enormous sky train of three and a half thousand aircraft headed out for continental Europe from airfields all over England. The aircraft carrying the 82nd and 101st U.S. Airborne Divisions were to take a southern route into Holland. The 101st U.S. Airborne Division was to secure the bridges from Eindhoven to Weigel. The 82nd U.S. Airborne Division was to secure the bridges from Grave to Nijmegen, as well as the Grisbeck Heights, which was an area of high ground overlooking the Lower Rhine. It was feared that the Germans might mount a counterattack through the heights. Meanwhile, the British 1st Airborne Division was taking a more northerly route. Initially, there was little opposition as the first troops began to land on Dutch soil just before 1 p.m. We're on the, the dropping and landing zones, which were used on the first day by the 1st Parachute Brigade and by the Air Landing Brigade to deposit themselves in this part of Holland and by the headquarters, or the bulk of the headquarters, of the 1st Airborne Division. Behind me is dropping zone X-ray. It was the dropping zone onto which first landed a platoon of the Independent Parachute Company to place its Eureka beacons and to mark out the panels or lay out the marker panels for the parachutists who would land a short while afterwards. And when they did arrive, the parachutists would begin dropping from their Dakota aircraft way down to the south, to the bottom end of this dropping zone with each succeeding wave of aircraft as it came in, dropping its paratroopers further and further north until the last sticks would land in the northern part of the dropping zone here, to the right as I'm looking at it, and to the left of this road, Telefonsweg, or Telephone Street, or Telephone Way, which runs up the centre of the uh, dropping zone, and which the pilots who were coming in, both towing gliders and dropping parachutists, used as a datum point to get their positioning to get their line correct. Parachutists jumping from an aircraft, there will be 19 in a Dakota, will be laden with something in the region of 100 to 120 pounds in weight. Not, not just the kit that they were carrying, the rucksacks they were carrying, the webbing and the, and the stores, but their clothing, their boots and everything else which accumulated to this considerable weight for the average infantryman of something like 110 to 115 pounds. But if you were a mortarman or a radio man or a medium machine gunner, you were of course carrying very much more. And you landed on what was arable land, partly ploughed, been used for crops, soft soil. So the first thing you do when you hit the ground is you suddenly find it's actually really quite difficult to run because your boots are getting clogged up and sinking in to the soil as you try and move to the rendezvous, which were marked in coloured smoke by men of your own battalion, by men of your own unit, and by men of the independent parachute company as well. When a parachutist exited the aircraft, he had a very short space of time in which to release from around his waist uh, the rope which held a kind of a container, which uh, he hung some 15 feet below him, containing those things he couldn't get on his back, basically, because there was a parachute there. Uh, there would be perhaps a weapon, more ammunition, uh, and, and, and equipment that he would be wanting to use. And in the time between him exiting the aircraft, his parachute deploying and him checking that, and him hitting the ground, which was only 10 to 15 seconds, he would have to lower this kit bag, at the 15 feet or so, on the end of a piece of rope that was attached to his waist, uh, so that it would land first, and then he would subsequently hit the ground after it, not to detach it from your leg or your waist and to land with it still hitched up, as it were, 
uh, invited a broken leg, basically. Uh, that was okay for the first parachutist to jump, but when a Dakota was dropping parachute soldiers, it went into a kind of a, a stalling glide. It slowed its speed right down to the point where it was only just about remaining airborne. So effectively, while they may have started jumping at 600 feet when the first parachutist jumped from an aircraft, they were only at 500 feet by the time the 19th one got out, and he had really rather less time to sort out his airborne administration than the chap who jumped first. And so there was an awful lot of fumbling at wastes going on up there as people came down and eventually struck the ground. It was a perfect drop uh, as far as the parachutists were concerned. Some people said the best they'd ever done and certainly the casualties probably less than they would experience on an exercise uh, in training. Uh, and from here the three battalions went in their in their three separate directions, although the routes they were following were essentially parallel, but they were some distance apart. And remember, these were airborne soldiers, extremely fit, very aggressive, but carrying huge weights. And really, therefore, their speed and their flexibility was limited to the pace at which they could move, carrying those weights over the distances that they were supposed to be carrying. The gliders, of course, landed before the parachutists some 20 minutes or so. And the first gliders to come in would be those of the Air Landing Brigade, which overflew this area because their landing zone is beyond us and further to the north. What came in here on the landing zone to the east of this dropping zone on which we're standing were those gliders which brought in divisional headquarters, divisional headquarters equipment, heavy equipment which couldn't be parachuted, such as guns, two batteries of artillery, for example, of the 1st Air Landing Light Regiment, anti-tank weapons, and various other pieces of equipment, together also with the couple of Bren gun carriers that each parachute battalion had on its establishment. Principally hawser gliders, but also some Hamilcar gliders coming in on this landing zone. Now the difficulty the glider pilots faced on this landing zone was that having been launched about three miles out, released their toes at a height of about three to four thousand feet, they were going to come straight in to the landing zone. I'm not a glider pilot, but I'm told that gliders, when a pilot is trying to land a glider, he quite likes to come in to the line of his landing at about 90 degrees, make a turn left or right to get himself settled and pick up a datum point which allows him to land effectively. The people coming from the south landing on the landing zone here uh, didn't have that opportunity. They were coming straight in tactically, diving in very fast off an approach, trying to make sure they could avoid any potential enemy fire against them. And so there was a tendency for the early gliders when they landed, for all the gliders when they landed, to overshoot the point that they picked to land at. And of course for those that landed in the north of the landing zone, they managed to embed themselves, eight or nine of them, in trees at the top end of the landing zone and that caused a certain amount of damage. There was also a certain amount of damage caused amongst the Hamilcar gliders and it was two of them, where not having a nose wheel, but the wheels of the glider, and it's a very heavy glider, being underneath the wings, when they hit this very soft soil, there was a tendency for the nose to bang down, for the glider to do a, a sort of a forward roll and land on its back. 